Good. Thanks, Chad. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you this morning. I want to talk about uh, some things that are based mostly in a paper that we put out about three months ago in October called The Influence of Teaching Beyond Standardized Test Scores, Mindsets, and, and Agency. Uh, this is based on surveys from our tripod surveys. We're about 15 years in and refining these ways of measuring what students experience in the classroom, both with regard to the quality of the teaching they experience, but also the peer dynamics and their own engagement. Um, this is um, the, the overarching notion for all the work that we do that I think about has to do with harvesting latent potential. And this is one of my favorite statements from Robert Schuller. Any fool can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. And so our work is very much about harvesting that latent, unmanifest potential. And the trying to give that sense to our teachers that they have potential themselves, in themselves, that is yet to be harvested at the same time that they work with their students to, to get this work done. The big picture here involves not just K-12, but also birth to five, and I'm not going to talk much about that today. I'm finishing a paper on the genesis of disproportionality uh, right now, and achievement gaps by race, gender, and socioeconomic status are stark in the national data by the age of two. So we can't wait till school starts. There's an initiative we just launched in Boston called the Boston Basics, <clears throat> where we've got five basic ideas about early childhood parenting, five propositions that we want everybody in the city to know. We're saturating the city. Uh, the mayor's office is, on, is in big time, the Achievement Gap Initiative at Harvard, a group called the Black Philanthropy Fund. There are five that are some senior African Americans who want to give back, WGBH, and the Pediatrics Department at Boston Medical Center. Uh, but the website is bostonbasics.org. Uh, the mayor mentioned it in the State of the City address a couple days ago, right at the end of the address. So I invite everybody to get in, and even outside of Boston, let's saturate the state with what uh, young parents of young children need to know in order that their kids don't fall behind by the age of two. Right? Um, the other circle here, race, gender, and poverty. Uh, race, gender, and poverty pervade everything we do. And so even as we think, about how to improve um, performance at every level, we need to be thinking about what are the overtones, the undertones, the ways the race, gender, and poverty are playing into what we're talking about. What I'm gonna talk about today is not directly about any of those things, but I wanted to put those things on the table as context for what we're talking about. The, um, there are two big boxes up here. There are tested outcomes, basic reading and math skills, academic knowledge, and so on, that we're accustomed to measuring. But then there are a bunch of other things that, that matter in life that I put under the heading of agency-related factors. Uh, there is no commonly accepted nomenclature for all that other stuff other than the testing stuff. You, there's a long list of words that people are using these days, and so you have to pay attention to exactly what they're talking about to figure out what they're talking about. Uh, I've been a defender of standardized testing ever since 1989-90, when we were start, started to be able to use the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth to look at the degree to which test scores predict employment outcomes. Um, kids ages 14 to 21 were tested in 1979. 10 years later, they were ages 24 to 31. We could look at their hourly wages and other employment outcomes to see how those basic skills measured during the teen years predicted outcomes as adults. And I still remember the experience of dropping a test score in a wage equation and knocking out most of the black-white hourly earnings gap. These test scores are measuring skills that employers pay for, and we shouldn't apologize for using them to track our progress in producing what kids need. At the same time, there are other things that employers pay for, too. Employers pay for your ability to show up on time and to take direction and to pay attention to the quality of your work and, and so on. And those other things need to come into what we aspire to produce in our students. And we need ways to measure those other things too. And so with the, with the tripod surveys we do, we measure those other things also. And I'm going to tell you some of the things we've learned from, from those uh, types of measures. And again, agency is a nice heading. This, the work that I'm talking about today was commissioned by the Rakes Foundation. 
they knew I had all this data and they said, what can we learn about agency from your work? And at the time, agency was not a word I used. And a word is not a word I wanted to use. <laughs> I was actually feeling pretty resistant to using that word, but that's how they wanted it framed. And so I started trying to figure out how to use it and ended up liking it quite a bit. Um, agency, more than something like socioeconomic, so, socio-emotional skills or um, non-cognitive skills, connotes the outcome we want, the, the action. We want students to have some sense of ability to control their lives. And a lot of the things that feed into agency um, are fit all these other non-cognitive and socio-emotional things people were talking about, but the word agency is a really nice umbrella term to, to capture a, a lot of it. The kinds of things that when a student has positive agency, I either have to turn and look over here or I have to put my glasses on so I can see the screen in front of me. <laughs> okay. Um, students have a lot of agency or have punctuality, good conduct, a mastery orientation, they exert effort in school, they believe in the, that, that if they work harder, they'll get smarter, growth mindset, they ask for help when they need it, their conscientiousness, in other words, they pay attention to the quality of their work, they have a sense of purpose, they know that, that what happens today is, is, is going to have an impact on what they can do tomorrow, so there's a future orientation. All those things are things that teachers can cultivate, that schools do cultivate, that we measure. Um, in the surveys we do. Students who lack agency, you pick up, they fake effort, <laughs> pretend they're trying when they're not, sometimes they just don't try it and don't even fake it. Um, they give up when work is hard, they avoid seeking help when they need it, they have no future orientation, and they lack a growth mindset. Okay, obviously you want the up arrow and not the down arrow. And we've learned a lot um, from the analysis I'm talking about, about what, what the teaching practices are, what, what elements of teaching produce these things for us. Um, I have a couple examples of kids just to kind of make it vivid. I'm not sure I've got time to, I'm going to, well, let me. Kirsten is academically passive. She feels indifferently about most of her assignments, does not seem to care whether she arrives on time to classes, feels uncertain about her ability, resists setting goals for academic performance. Her effort in school is sporadic and she almost never asks for help. Even when she works hard, she hides her effort and pretends to be disinterested. When work is challenging, she gives up. She worries about her future but feels but feels powerless to chart her own path. There are a lot of kids like that. Jarrell was once like Kristen. I, I, it's the first, I, no, it was Kristen. I said, Kirsten at the top, typo. <laughs> Jarrell was once like Kristen, but his teachers helped him develop agency. Now in eighth grade, he arrives to classes on time and pays attention. Still lagging many of his peers academically, he stays focused on his own goals and progress, not on others. When confused, he seeks help, expecting the confusion will be temporary. He looks forward to, his, looks forward to high school and is optimistic about the future. Jarrell anticipates finding a career in which he can be successful and someday raising a family. Okay, two different kids. Jarrell used to be like her, but his teachers helped him to, to overcome that. Quick definition of agency. It's essentially the capacity and propensity to take purposeful initiative. Okay, it's a simple boil down definition, the capacity and propensity to take purposeful initiative. That's what we want. And I see some people trying to keep up with the notes. Uh, they're going to post the PowerPoint, so just. Um, and this is the kid taking purposeful initiative. <laughs> and it looks like she's impressed, so he succeeded. <laughs> Uh, we measure teaching using what we call the tripod seven C's of effective teaching. Care, confer, captivate, clarify, consolidate, challenge, classroom management. The first five are academic support. The last two, challenge and management, are more, more academic press. Uh, the, the other paper that I'm not talking about today that I'm just finishing on the roots of disproportionality, uh, for elementary schools in particular, the greatest disparity in access to quality learning experiences is access to an orderly classroom, particularly at the upper elementary level. Uh, teachers need a lot of help with that. The lower the more students of color, the more lower income students, the more students agree, students behave in our class. So the behavior in our class is so bad that it gets in the way of our learning. Okay, you get un, you really depressingly high agreement with a statement like that. So um, footnote, we gotta work on classroom management. At the secondary level, it's multidimensional. It's not just classroom management. It's almost all these things 
that de deteriorate the more students of color and the more uh, lower income kids. Um, we have started to distinguish what we call develop the development of success skills and mindsets from the status on success skills and mindsets. Most psychologists and other researchers, when they look at um, things like growth mindset, conscientiousness, future orientation, and so on, um, just use status measures. They ask, you know, what kind of person are you? Um, for various reasons that I don't have time to explain now, it also helps to ask whether uh, in this class students learn to believe they can get smarter. Okay, so you're asking, in this class do you have an experience that develops growth mindset? In this class we learn to pay attention to the quality of our work. In this class we learn to use time wisely. My teacher in this class uh, inspires me to think more about going to college. Okay, all those have to do with the mindsets that are developed in the classroom and not just are you this type of person. And some of the analysis that we've done that's, again, beyond what we have time to talk about, shows that if you're in classrooms where most of the students agree that in this class we learn these things, those same classrooms are places where individuals agree, I'm just that type of person, okay? And, and we have really nice, neat ways of controlling and adjusting for all these things. And so kids' sense of identity, we can think about the evolution of identity coming off of repeated classroom experiences where kids are learning these mindsets that we want. And after a while, they'd say, well, that's just who I am, okay? And thinking harder about that, helping teachers understand that can help us get on the same page with, about, with regard to a lot of this stuff. Um, to give you a sense of the magnitudes of some of the effects, um, this is just five statements that are all expressions of expressions of agency. I've pushed myself hard to completely understand my lessons in this class. When doing schoolwork, I try to learn as much as I can. Don't worry about how long it takes. I've done my best quality work in the class all year. In this class, students learn to focus more on the quality of their work, and I would ask the teacher for help if I needed it. All those are agency-related statements. You can um, rank order all the class. We have, like, I think there are about 16,000 classrooms in this particular study. You can rank order the, all those classrooms by the seven C's composite, break them into five classroom quality quintiles, and then ask how much agreement is there with these statements in the top quintile versus the bottom quintile of that. And so here, if you look, uh, if you take agreement to be, it's at least somewhat true, uh, somewhat mostly or totally true, those statements. Overall, in the top 20% of the classrooms, 82% agree that those statements on average are at least somewhat true. In the bottom quintile, it's only 52% agree that those statements are, are at least somewhat true. So there's a lot of variation uh, across classrooms in, in this this material. Uh, just a note on why should we take students' feedback seriously. Uh, the Gates Foundation did a huge project called Measures of Effective Teaching. They used our tripod surveys for the student voice piece. And just taking, and they surveyed the same teachers, it, students in multiple classrooms. So you can look at, at, at within teacher between classroom correlations, for example. And you can also do that for standardized test score gains and other measures. Well, the within teacher cross classroom correlation for all the test score measures is shown at the top and they range between point, basically from point two to point four roughly. Uh, for each of the separate components of the student uh, voice of the tripod seven C's, the within teacher between classroom correlations are all between point six and point seven for the most part. So it makes sense. You've got 20 kids who are there every day, all day with the same teacher it has got a knucklehead on one end, it's balanced out by a conservative student on the other end, and so you get a, a measure that, that doesn't have as much noise in it as a lot of the other ways that we can measure classrooms. And, it can, and you can adjust it or not adjust it for the nature of the kids that are taught, depending upon the purpose that you're using it for. And we have all those kinds of things worked out. The feedback is reported by graphs, that, charts that look like this that I don't have time to explain, but basically we, the scores are on a range of, of 200 to 400, and um, they're normed at, so the center at 300, and a teacher on each dimension can see how they compare to other teachers on that particular dimension. And if we, we can also adjust it for the nature of kids you're teaching, so you can see how you compare to other teachers who are teaching the same kind of kids that, that you're teaching, for example. Um, and then you get item by item detail. One of the things that we discovered recently that's most interesting is that the components of teaching 
that are most important for predicting happiness and inspiration are different from the components that are important for predicting annual test score gains. So if you want to maximize uh, value-added test score growth, what's most important is challenging and challenge in classroom management. You have a hard-nosed teacher that puts the pedal to the metal. He challenges kids to stay on task, to think hard, to, think, to persist in the face of difficulty, to be rigorous, um, and you're going to get big gains. They may not want to come back to school next year, but <laughs> they worked really hard, and they got test score gains. Um, the, <clears throat> and, and, those, and, and if you put clarify behind those two, you got most of the action on value added. On the other hand, if you want to inspire your students who want to go to college, those things don't matter hardly at all. If you want to inspire your students to go to college, what matters most is captivate and care. A teacher who makes it really interesting and connects with you in a personal way. Uh, those also happen to be the things that most strongly predict happiness in class. <laughs> okay. So if we want to get the test score gains, we do one set of things. We want to be happy and have high aspirations for the future, we do a different set of things. Obviously, we want both, so we need to do all those things. Okay, so there's some implicit guidelines for teaching that come out of, of the results that we have. And um, I'll go through these quickly and try to say a little word about why, the word, why it's worded the way it is. Be attentive, attentive and sensitive, but avoid a tendency to coddle. Be attentive and sensitive, but avoid a tendency among sensitive teachers to coddle students in ways that hold them to lower standards and undermine their agency. Caring teachers are sometimes coddling teachers. So, and that, that it comes through in, in the findings. Encourage and respect students' perspectives and honor student voice, but also stay focused on instructional goals. Avoid extended discussions that have no apparent purpose and thereby fail to model self-discipline and effective agency. The confer um, component of teaching often comes in negative in our analysis. But if you think about what is it in service to, we're holding constant most of the other things teachers do. So if you're not trying to clarify or captivate or challenge or consolidate or keep students on task, what are you conferring about? <laughs> it's probably idle chatter, <laughs> okay? And so I think the residual effect of confer is often uh, not what we want and getting teachers to be sure if you're conferring, you're staying on task, it's about something. Uh, captivate, strive to make lessons stimulating, interesting, relevant. If some students seem unresponsive, do not assume they're disinterested. Some students, and especially those who struggle, purposefully hide their interest and their effort. And we pick up uh, far more students than you might guess. Uh, pretend they're not trying even when they are trying. Sometimes they'll hold back for fear of what their, their, student, their, their, their classmates might say. Consolidate, regularly summarize and check for understanding because consolidation helps to solidify learning and models your agency as a teacher, even when students seem reticent or disinterested. And that summary at the end of the classroom, that consolidation, pulling it together, is actually the strongest predictor of whether kids agree. In this class, we learn a lot almost every day. Because at the end of the period, you told them what they learned, <laughs> right, regularly. Clarify. Clarify by clearing up confusion. Take regular steps to detect and respond to confusion in class, but in ways that share responsibility with students for doing the thinking. Clear, clearing up confusion also comes in negative, other things equal often on things that have to do with effort and persistence. Because sometimes teachers will jump in there too quickly and clear it up without letting kids struggle a little bit and figure it out for, them, for themselves. So there's a balance to strike on clearing up confusion. Lucid explanations, the second piece there, is nothing, that, that doesn't hurt you ever, <laughs> being clear um, when you explain things. And finally, Instructive feedback, uh, give instructive feedback to help scaffold student learning and correcting their own work and building their own understandings. Challenge by, uh, with rigor and persistence, pressing students to think deeply instead of superficially and consistently requiring students to keep trying even when the work is, is difficult are those two pieces. And those two pieces don't hurt you either, except that for a teacher who really challenges kids, the kids feel a little bit less efficacious because that teacher is putting them in positions where they can't always do what they're being asked to, to do. And finally, classroom management. And here we want to manage classrooms, keep them orderly by, with clarify, captivate, and challenge, which among the C's as they predict each other, those are the strongest predictors of classroom management. If it's clear, it's interesting, and it's challenging, kids are going to be on task more uh, than otherwise. You can also get a class uh, orderly by intimidation. Okay, um, but 
obviously that's not the way you want to do it. I have a colleague who says, you know, are kids ever disorderly during the magic show? I mean, they're so <laughs> tuned in and preoccupied um, that, that they're not um, disorderly. So should agency be promoted actively as an explicit goal of teaching and learning? How important do you think agency is compared to the knowledge and skills of standardized test measure? How can agency be promoted? Uh, I've had colleagues that say we should not try to use the word agency because people don't know what it is. Um, and maybe, but all the other words that people think they know what it is, they don't know what those are either. <laughs> okay. So any way we go, we need to do some public education so we can get on the same page about what this, the semantics uh, mean here. I think there's huge potential to help students on dimensions other than those that standardize test measure, even though standardized tests are really important. Okay, um, I'll end with uh, my three internet addresses, the Achievement Gap Initiative, Harvard, agi.harvard.edu, the paper I've just talked about. If you go to the publications page, the Achievement Gap Initiative, the paper is there. Um, tripod Education Partners, if you want to know more about tripod surveys and so on, it's there. And the Boston Basics Campaign, um, is, is there, and I really invite you to tune into the Boston Basics. So with that, I'm done. <laughs>